Welcome to Free Kiwis. We're delighted today to be joined by Graham Linehan, a comedian, comedy writer, and perhaps reluctant political activist. Uh, maybe the comedy is a good place to start. Perhaps what you're most famous for is Father Ted. So yeah. tell us about a bit about that. Uh, how, how did you get into that idea and uh, why was it so successful? Uh, well, when I was growing up, there was in Irish fiction and kind of Irish culture, uh, very many priests. Um, and I remember there was a there was a short story section in in the newspaper called uh, the Sunday Tribune that I always wanted to get in. So I would read the other short stories to see what kind of thing they were accepting. And there seemed to be a priest in every single one. And I swore to myself I would never write a single thing involving priests, you know, as a, as a result. But what happened was I met Arthur Matthews, who was a uh, who worked with me in a music magazine called Hot Press in Dublin. And Arthur had a, a singular sense of humour. It, it was very... I'd never heard anything like it. There was something about the way he said things, the way he looked at the world, that was just... I, I adored him. You know, he was nine years older than me. He was a veteran of the punk wars, and he was the funniest person I ever met. The story I always tell is one day we were coming out of the office, which was up a few flights of stairs, and... Um, he deliberately fell down the stairs to make us all laugh. And as he fell, he had a confused look on his face, as if he hadn't just decided to do this. And it was one of the funniest things I ever saw. And uh, as I said in the book, I kind of fell in love with him <laughs> for that. You know, I'd never seen anyone do anything like that before. So I was very interested in impressing Arthur and, uh, you know, uh, kind of being guided by him and... Uh, trying to collaborate with them where I could. So we did this uh, band called the Joshua Trio. Arthur was the drummer, and the lead singer was a guy, he, he had loads of costume changes. He was playing Bono. It was basically a parody of Bono and U2. They would do things like Where the Streets Have No Name uh, in the style of Frank Sinatra, mm. you know, which became, after a while, a bit of a, a thing that many bands would do. But I think Paul was among the first to, to, to do that. But Arthur was on drums... And uh, when Paul was off getting a costume change, Arthur would go to the microphone and he would slip on, he, he always wore a black shirt, and he would slip on a collar and he would start doing this character, Father, Father Ted. Um, and he would just make church announcements to, the, to, the, to this gig venue. One of my favourites was, he would say, um, if there's anyone at the back who can't see, say hello to them, they're from St. Kevin's School for the Blind. You know, so it was, he was already writing really cracking gags. And um, we started working together and doing little sketches involving Joshua Trio, where we recreated moments in, uh, in U2's career. Um, and we just realized we could write things down and have them be funny. Um, and the characters were coming across. And one day I just, I went over to the UK to write, music journalism for for a bigger magazine and I just one day I just said do you want to come over and give it a go you know so he came over which blew me away because he was such a he's someone who doesn't like his life disrupted and uh, uh, it really surprised me he only expected to be over for a few months and he ended up staying 10 years and we and we wrote Father Ted during that time but uh, but the thing that kind of you know First, basically, I loved his Father Ted character. There was, uh, funnily enough, Dermot Morgan, who later went on to play Father Ted, he did a character called Father Trendy, which everyone thought Ted was based on. And Father Trendy was the kind of priest who who says to people, isn't, isn't Jesus a bit like punk rock? You know, that type mm, of thing. Yeah. You know? And um, and it was much, it was, it was, it, it was satire in a different way. Arthur's Ted was was more he was almost slightly camp you know he would never say he would never raise his voice he's always talking a little bit like this and and uh you know we we, we kind of realized a lot of things about the character at the same time for instance we realized he would never say a bad word he would always say feck instead of instead of the strong one um uh or or even flip you know 
<laughs> I have it in the book that if someone stole his car, he'd say, he'd he'd sh- he'd rant, flip those flipping flippers, you know, rather than actually uh, do anything that might offend anyone. And um, Arthur had cousins who were priests, and he would tell me stories about them, and also kind of priest facts. Like, for instance, he would say, he would tell me that priests get very uncomfortable when you talk about religion. They don't want to talk about it, <laughs> you know. Um, and he would say things like uh, uh, priests, um, uh, they all know each other. Every he, he said every priest knows every other priest in the world, <laughs> you know. And these were exaggerations, but only just, you know. They certainly knew every other priest in Ireland. And uh, I think Arthur's kind of proximity to these uh, to these uncles of his just made the voice very accessible to him. Yeah. So when we were writing Ted, we had what I would later find out was was something that was very precious and and very hard to happen upon, which is a fully formed voice. So uh, so yeah, it it just kind of once you have one fully formed voice, it's actually quite easy to find the other voices that will tease different things out of them, you know? So we had Dougal would tease out Ted's anger and frustration and, and Mrs. Doyle would tease something else out and Father yeah. Jack another thing, you know, Ted's instinctive respect for the elderly, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it just kind of, and to, to answer the second part of, of your question, um, I think the reason it was a success beyond the surrealism and the fact we had a kind of a secret weapon in Dougal, uh, Ardell O'Hanlon, who played Dougal, who just totally got the character immediately. Um, uh, I think beyond that, we kind of accidentally created a family, you know, a father, a son, uh, a, a mother, and a grandfather. And people love seeing families reflected on screen, especially kids, you know. So I think almost by accident, we, we just had all the ingredients for a success. You know, yeah. well, it's, it's already quite controversial, though. I mean, looking back twenty years ago, you know, a show about a priest, uh, or maybe a family of priests, set in Ireland. I mean, obviously, there's the there's the fact that the Catholic Church is still quite popular and still quite strong. So, did you get any pushback on that front? And then the other thing, of course, is doing it in Britain. Uh, you know, nowadays people would say, "Oh, there's a long history of kind of anti-Irish racism. You're mocking an ethnic minority. Isn't that terrible? You should have been deplatformed even then, right?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well they belong- tried. Belonging to that minority yourself probably helps in that, that regard. Yeah. yeah, indeed. I there was a show that used to be on Channel Four called Right Right to Reply, and they brought me onto it to have a debate with this woman, and she was a second generation Irish woman, so she had a Mancunian accent. So you had a woman with a English accent telling an Irishman that he was being racist. And I always felt a bit sorry for her because I have a feeling they didn't tell her that it was written by Irish people. I think they might have set her up, you know, because I, I'm now so used to how TV works that I bet that's what happened. Mm. Um, and, you know, I was very defensive of my show and, and I gave her both barrels and it just didn't turn out. It, it, it looked, it was absurd. It was an absurd argument. It didn't really work. And my argument about that whole thing was, you know, if you told Jewish people that they couldn't make fun of Jews, then there would be no comedy at all. There'd be no Jewish comedy at any rate. Well, <laughs> I think Jewish comedy and American comedy are one and the same. Mm. And and they basically, the uh, Jewish people kind of uh, form the, what might be recognized as the American comic voice. You know, so, uh, so it's like, what... It's always been this thing, and, and, and it extends to the, the two ideas like punching down. You can't punch down, you know? And that means that you immediately exclude um, all these people who are arbitrarily kind of chosen to be lower than me as an Irish white man. Yeah, and I think I'm not, the, the I'm word not, arbitrarily is, is exactly right, mm. because what, what does down mean exactly? Yeah, we we, we can down, construct various hierarchies in yeah. our minds, but yeah. actually there's all sorts of things that make people different that are funny. Yes, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the thing is that um, once you once you make that once you uh, follow that rule, it means that you're immediately excluding whole groups from comedy. Like you know, when we were writing, one of the things we were very uh, 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 careful about was we hated something that was a bit of a trope at the time, which was women 
whose only contribution to the comedy was to kind of be exasperated at the behavior of the men. So the women were basically straight men, you know, playing against these men who were allowed to be funny. And the reason that happened is because men were terrified of writing women with faults, with flaws. So Mrs. Doyle, we just thought, let's go for it. Let's make her as funny as we can. Let's give her as many flaws as we can. Um, And, uh, you know, let's go the opposite way to these characters that we were so sick of in other comedies and make her not feminist, but kind of subservient and believing that that was her role to be subservient, you know? And as a result, it's one of the most beloved characters we've ever created, you know? Well, this is the, one of the absurdities of this way of thinking, that you, you look at Mrs. Doyle and say, oh, okay, the authors are recommending that women are all like that. I mean, yeah. That's obviously not the case, right? In any given show, there may be any number of things that a, that a character's doing. I mean, she may just be being funny, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when, when I did the IT crowd later on, uh, I think trans activists tr- tried this on. Uh, but they tried to say that the main female character in that was uh, sexist because she didn't know anything about computers. Uh, she was a dunce when it came to computers. But the whole idea of the show was that we were we were putting someone who was uh, an expert in social interactions together with uh, two men who weren't. And the two men were an expert in computers and the woman wasn't. And that interplay just gave us tons of material. And again it gave Catherine something funny to do, you know? I mean, you do sometimes meet, in reality, men who are more interested in computers than people and women who are more interested in people than computers. I mean, that's actually something that's the subject of scholarship. They found big differences between men and women in terms of interest in people versus interest uh, in things. Absolutely. It doesn't mean one side is more capable. It's just a matter of where people tend to gravitate. So, Well, well also, I, I mean, stereotypes are the basis of a lot of comedy, aren't they? Are they? Because it seems to me one of the roles of the comedian is, is to point at things that everybody knows are tr- is true or, or often true and, yes. and make fun of that in a way that allows you to say it with, without being serious about it or without making it too emphatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sometimes sometimes when you, when you get a comedian who is telling the truth, someone like Louis C.K. or um, Dave Chappelle, um, you can hear a kind of a release from the audience. Oh, thank God yeah. someone is pointing this out and mentioning it because I've always noticed it and I'm not allowed to say it, you know? So I think that's part of the role of a comedian is to provide an escape valve right. for silly ideas that, that, that everybody is following without really knowing why. And in that regard, actually... You- it serves a role beyond entertainment, beyond mere entertainment. It becomes actually, as you say, a, a release valve for social pressure. Yes. And if that isn't allowed to happen, then it gets bottled up. Yes. And is likely to come out in much angrier ways. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, and I think that it's adding to the, uh, how do you pronounce febrile? Is it febrile or feb? Real or Fe- febrile sounds febrile, good I think it is. Um, it's adding to this very febrile atmosphere where uh, people are getting angrier and angrier. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in Ireland, every time one of our woke politicians uh, says something particularly stupid, they turn off replies because they are, right. they're basically an aristocracy and they don't really want to hear from the, the peons, you know? Um, And now what's happening is you have uh, people following these politicians down the street with their iPhones, filming them, throwing questions at them, harassing them. And the uh, and the result of that is that the politicians are doubling down. They're they're going even deeper into their echo chambers and they're refusing to engage. And the public are getting angrier and angrier. And recently we had the first riots we've had in Dublin in I don't know when, decades at least, you know. Um, and it's just this frustration that you have a, a um, not just politicians, but even a comedy class who simply do not want to hear from the public. Right. Know? I mean, you, you, you mentioned an aristocracy, and we can think of at least the apocryphal role of the court jester in the Middle Ages, which was... He was the guy who was allowed to make fun of the king. Yeah. Uh, and maybe for that kind of reason, and sensible monarchs might have seen that role as being important. Yeah. But the aristocracy now is so removed from the, the, the kind of common 
parlance and looks down so much that they don't even want that. Yeah, yeah. And another another thing that's happened is that the the person who now occupies the throne is the mob, you know? And the mob is composed of so many people that it means that you can't make fun of anyone. Mm. Is, it, is it the popular mob, though? Is it the ordinary... Um, I was almost going to say the ordinary man. I could cancel myself and back up. <laughs> is it just the ordinary person, or is it is it this sort of media elite? I mean, I think it's, it's the media more elite. Of, more of that, isn't it? Yeah, and it's the and it's the people who's it's it's a lot of mediocre people who who uh, are able to climb a ladder uh, made up of the careers and bodies of other people, more talented people. Like, for instance, in my own case. Uh, there's actually one here, in, or sorry, there's one over in Australia, um, uh, and there's one in Ireland, and they're they're failed comedians. They're both they're both unsuccessful comedians, and they've made it their lives to try and cancel and destroy the careers of people who, you know, they don't want to um, follow the fashionable sibyleths or however you pronounce that word of the time yeah. so uh so essentially what and, and neither both of them are straight men straight white men you know so neither of them are the minorities they're ostensibly protecting they are that word allies you know which is which is a word that now just fills me with terror you know because these are the people who um stand to benefit most you know in the same way that I don't want to go onto it too early, but the trans movement benefits mostly white men. They're the, they're the men who get the most out of it, straight white men. Mm. And it's it's funny that at a time when, you know, we were just about reaching some form of equality between men and women, um, and at the same time, white men were beginning to be seen as toxic and, and uh, uh uh, corrosive to society that the, their very masculinity was at the same time all this happened suddenly a whole tranche of white men decided they were women fascinating yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean it's, it's occurred to me that uh if you're a young white man or, or even you know a teenager and you read the zeitgeist and you see that being a white man is not all that fashionable mm. uh, and maybe you're a bit of a nerd or a bit marginalised at school. Yeah. A really good way to go from the bottom of the pecking order to the top is yeah. perhaps to decide that you're not a man at all. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, the, and that's not to say that um, every single person who does it is uh, doing it for, uh, you know, m- mendacious, I guess. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that that's right, that yeah. they're not. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of men who are kind of in flight from their own masculinity because they've been brainwashed in, into thinking that there's something wrong with their desires uh with the things that they like doing um and they can kind of it's interesting so many there's so many trans identified twitch gamers who are on on twitch uh, uh streaming their games and they're just blokes playing games mm. but now they are women in gaming <laughs> you know and they can they can uh, not legit. Not I was gonna. They can illegitimately say that they are increasing the amounts of women in gaming, you know. And it's it's just not true. It's just more men. So uh, uh, yeah. And I think w- another one of the reasons why uh, a lot of these men are so vicious online is because it it hits their bottom line. You know, they've they've built up a a following as a trans streamer, and so if you kind of say well. You know, you're not transsexual. You know, you, you don't have gender d- dysphoria. You've just grown your hair long and put on some black uh, fingernail polish. Um, that actually is affecting their bottom line. So they're going to be very, very angrily defending that. Yeah. So I, I guess one question then is sort of how do you tell? I mean, because, you know, I know at least one trans person who has probably been doing this for like 20 years. and she, I, I feel it's natural to call her she because to me she presents as a she. Sure. And takes it very seriously. And then I see people in the public eye, like um, the Canadian actress who did Juno. I mean, she's actually yes. transitioned more seriously now, but for a while she was just cutting her hair short. Yeah. And then she wanted different pronouns. And I sort of thought, well, you know, the, there must be some kind of level at which people are allowed to kind of tap out and say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go along with that. I'm going to go along with, with this one and be able to pick and choose. Of course, you're not supposed to be allowed to pick and choose. Yeah. But in your, own, in your own mind, though, if you meet trans people or people claiming to be trans people, you know, what's the line in your head? 
Well, I, I, I distinguish between uh, my, my public and private approach to it. You know, uh, there's definitely trans people I know who are very convincing as women. There's one person I know, Seven Hex is, uh, uh, I will say, I hope Seven doesn't mind, but I will say his for the purposes of this, for the reasons I'll explain. Uh, but Seven is um, very, really reminds me of a lot of women I used to know in music journalism. And I totally think of Seven as a, as a, as a woman in, in a personal way one-on-one sense you know i i would instinctively without thinking of it use female pronouns for seven but in public because of the current situation i can't do that because so much ground has been taken by this movement that i i have to be consistent and i have to be um and i will not insult women by 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 giving any ground on this. So in public, I'm, I'm different. You know, in public, I, I try and be clear. I try and apologize if I have to, if I have to use male pronouns um, to talk about someone. But in private, I mean, it never even comes up because usually you're talking yeah. to these people. Yeah. You know? Well, that's right. So you're not referring to them in the third person. Exactly, yeah. 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 So, and that's, I think, the main thing that shows you that this is an authoritarian movement because they're trying to make you behave in a certain way when people are actually absent. That's you right. Know? Every moment of your life, right? I mean, the scholarly yes. hate speech law seemed to have some clause in it for a while that you would, they would be able to apply, you know, uh, conversations around the kitchen table and that kind of thing, or the, yeah. di- the dinner table at your house. Yeah, yeah. But, so one way I try and think about this, this is probably going to offend a lot more people, but, so, uh, you know, well, this is free this is Free Kiwi Week. So here we yeah. go. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like a respectful thing because, so um, I had a Catholic girlfriend in the past. We used to go to church sometimes. Mm. I didn't really believe it. She was more into it. So, you know, when I'm in a Catholic church, I don't immediately go up to the front and say, this is all nonsense. This yes. isn't really the blood. This isn't literally the blood of Christ. How could it, you know, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking that inside. Or usually inside, I'm just sort of, ch- if I'm in a church service, I'm just sort of chilling and thinking this is nice. It's mm. nice music and things. I, I quite like the atmosphere. Yeah. But, you know, so I'm not going to say that to my girlfriend. This is all nonsense. Yeah. But I reserve the right in other contexts to say that, you know, if I'm having a philosophical debate about religion, about my own beliefs, if I'm writing an article... Yeah. You know, I think people should be allowed to say that is not literally the blood of Christ without getting, you know, dragged away by the Inquisition or yeah. fired or whatever. And it's a similar thing with, with trans stuff that often, if I'm with someone who obviously takes it extremely seriously that they want to present as a woman, then I'll go with that out of respect. I mean, you know, I think that's maybe in a lot of situations due to the person. Um, depending on how they behave, of course. If sure. you're trying to be too tyrannical about it, it's another thing. Yeah. But then... I also think if people want to discuss this issue on a podcast or they want to write an article about it, want to talk about it philosophically like Kathleen Stock, mm. then of course you're allowed to say, I think deep down some of these people are, or all these people maybe are actually males dressing up as females or females mm. dressing up as males. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and I think that one of the things that, that so-called trans allies don't uh, take into account is by by placing a transsexual who's had severe gender dysphoria has taken a number of of incredibly physically um, invasive uh, gone through a number of incredibly invasive procedures to get to where they are. That is very different from Eddie Izzard, who dresses up as a man when he needs when he goes for a meeting with Steven Spielberg. You know, that is very different from people who can wipe off makeup and suddenly they're no different from any other uh, uh, man. And the problem that I think we're seeing, and I've heard from a lot of transsexuals, is that the medical care that these transsexuals need because of the mental problem that they had is becoming harder to differentiate from these other people who are doing it for a variety of reasons. You know, some, uh, some became you know, lost in pornography, you know, some uh, were just kind of cross-dressers who were doing it when their wife was out and then suddenly decided it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a kind of a human rights issue and uh, lose their marriage and uh, their kids because they want to do it full time. Well, you know? Andrew Doyle's made the point as well that a lot of same-sex attracted young people can, yes. can be inadvertently put on this track to thinking that they're trans uh, yeah. rather than just gay. Well, one of the most shocking uh, bits of evidence we have about all this is, it's very interesting, this whole this whole movement has happened in plain sight. Uh, and whenever you kind of point it out, you, suddenly web pages are deleted, you know, and uh, 
uh, certain things just disappear from the internet. And one of those things was Susie Green's TED Talk. Susie Green was the head of Mermaids, which was the big... Funnily enough, it used to be a good organization. It was literally just for dysphoric children, you know, of whom there weren't very many because the internet hadn't arrived yet, you know. Susie Green joined Mermaids and completely transformed it into suddenly, uh, you know, uh, you know, I remember once there was a mermaid slide that said that had all the signs that your child might be trans. And it was just a list of things that happened to kids during puberty. You know, mm. it was stuff like they may feel, uh, you know, separate from their friends. You know, they may feel uncomfortable in their bodies. It was just a list of normal things, you know. And Susie Green did this TED Talk where she spoke about her own story. And she bas- she, she admitted uh, that the reason uh, she thinks her, her son was actually her daughter is because her husband was a homophobe who didn't like the fact that the son was playing with girls' toys. So they hid the girls' toys for a while. The child was incredibly unhappy. And then I think Paris, Susie kind of uh, glosses over this part, but I think basically Susie went online and radicalized herself by going to these forums uh, where she was learning about this new philosophy that, you know, it's not a mental illness, it's a state of being, like being gay. And she just kind of um, saw this as a way to rescue her marriage and, and keep her husband or, or, or else punish her husband. So one of the two. And she started to put her kid on hormones. And on the, on, the, on the eve of the kid's 15th birthday, they were in the air going to Thailand and they cut off his penis on his 16th birthday, you know. Um, yeah, so I, I can't remember how we got into. Well, that's it. A, that's a big that's a big thing. It's a big decision. So I guess again, a question might be, yeah. So the, the people making these kind of irreparable life decisions at sixteen, or their, or their parents are doing it for them, some of them are just going to grow out of it anyway. I mean, studies suggest that a lot of those kids who are playing with you know gender atypical toys are just going to grow up gay. Mm. However, I think there are still uh, there's still some number of people I think who maybe you disagree with us, who would be trans. So how do you tell? I mean, I guess maybe this is a clinical question or something. But do you- No, I think there's a very simple answer to this, which is, you know, we, we need urgently to go back to the time where operations and cross-sex hormones are a last-ditch solution. That's, it's that simple. And, and what's happened is that the inverse has been in place for the last few years, where it is the first uh, port of call. And... Uh, There's been a kind of self-grooming system online where these kids are going online who are unhappy because of their, because of puberty, or perhaps because they're trans, you know, they have gender dysphoria. Although I don't really believe in the concept of being trans. I I think that you can have gender dysphoria. I think that's how I would put it. And... um, and they go online and they do what Susie Green did. They radi- radicalize themselves. And there are plenty of people online who are... I know one uh, detransitioner, Richie Heron, and he told me that there are men online who um, who uh, derive pleasure from convincing young boys that they are trans and getting them to cut their uh, genitals off, you know? And I don't know whether you're aware of this, but one of the revelations uh, uh, that that the uh, online magazine Redux um, uh, discovered and which was reproduced recently in the WPATH files is that the WPATH linked to a website called the Eunuch Archives. And WPATH have also made Eunuch a gender identity. Now the Eunuch Archives, which they link to, remember this is supposed to be the world leader in trans healthcare, is a repository of Erotic short stories about castration. Mm-hmm. 40% of the 4,000, 5,000 stories on that website are tagged minor. Many of them are about kids being transitioned, kids receiving. There was one exchange between um, two members of the forum where they were talking about, they shared a video of Jazz Jennings' operation. And one, one member said to the other, Thanks for sharing the video. I found it interesting, brackets, and a little arousing. This is surgery on a minor, you know? Um, And no one is kind of taking into account these uh, 
extra elements that are giving rise to this situation. And again, the way that that will be solved is if it's a last ditch, end of the road, can't do anything else, we have to give, provide surgery and hormones. That has to happen, you know. But also these, these forces, these terrifying forces, have to be recognised and rooted out of, of positions of influence over, well, over medicine. I mean, I think I, I can guess what someone on the other side would say here, which is just something like, that's not very common. So they say that's one or two people on the internet. You can find anything on the internet. You know, the mainstream movement is much more reasonable. Uh, you know, most of these doctors, most of these parents, they aren't. They don't have a sexual interest in these ki- in these kids. Sure, Would you agree with that? Yeah, but this is W path. Like this is where uh, the NHS got its uh, uh, got its uh, uh, principles in dealing with trans healthcare. So W path is linking to this porno- child pornography site. So you have to kind of work backwards to organizations like that, remove them from the picture, you know, completely, so that we can we can give the people who really need the care the care they need, you know, yeah. and we can stop what is happening, which is kind of mass hypnosis via the internet, that there is a state called trans, that it is not a mental health problem, uh, that it's perfectly natural like homosexuality, you know, it's terribly dangerous to say this to, to a whole population or whole populations, you know. And setting aside the question of, you know, some people getting their thrills, as it were, from surgery on minors, what concerns me is that that there are far too many young people being almost channeled into this. Yeah. Uh, And parents who ask questions can be set aside by the system. Uh, Even arrested in some places? uh, That's happened. Uh, And we've had the phenomenon of the Tavistock Clinic in the UK, which has now been closed. and. Mm. I think it's now a matter of record that what they were doing was massively overzealous. Yeah, yeah. And so we've got people who are in a vulnerable stage of life, adolescents, and and who are vulnerable in other ways by definition if they're in this situation where they're contemplating puberty blockers or even more irreparably the, the the kind of surgery that yeah. they, they end up getting and then there are, there are many cases of them regretting it yeah in, in their early adulthood and and so it seems to me that i mean i agree with you that the, the these radical interventions should be a, a last resort and and also i think they they shouldn't be undertaken on minors at all yeah yeah well one of the things the cast report found I mean, first of all, the, the Susie Green uh, speech that was wiped from the internet, um, you know, it's a confession. It's a confession that it was homophobia, you right. know, that, that led to this. But there's other, there's other things uh, going on as well. One of the things that the Cass report found was there was, quote unquote, an, an overrepresentation of parents bringing their children to, uh, to be transed whose first child had died and was the opposite sex, Mm. you know? So it's a mess. Mm. (laughs) It's just, it's just a mess. And And uh, made more of a mess by the fact that if you talk about it, you get stomped on. Yeah. And that again, there's all these things that are deliberate, you know, it's deliberate that uh, the temperature to entering this uh, conversation is kept so high, Uh, you know, and as a result, you, I, there's a there's a kind of conspiracy of silence amongst the British entertainment world. They're all pretending they can't see it, you know, and they all kind of trump, trumpet trans rights. And every time you, you lay out the issues, they just pretend they can't see it. Again, that aristocracy, you know. But do you think this conversation is particularly toxic, though? Because, I mean, there are lots of things you're not supposed to talk about nowadays, or at least not in certain ways, like race and feminism and all the rest, but... This one seems to really call upon, call down the kind of wrath of yes. some pretty disturbed people. And so I wonder, is that is that just a happenstance that it happened to go this way? I mean, one possibility is that because trans identity, or, or whatever you want to call it, often depends on people saying certain things about you. You know, if you want to be treated by a woman, that might actually involve people talking, to people saying you're a woman, talking about you as if you're a woman. Mm because it sort of depends intrinsically on, on what people are saying and how you're perceived, that is the mechanism for these kind of uh, attempts to control free speech. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, 
again, I think that the trans movement over of everyone it benefits white men the most, and I think that's why the the borders are control are are, are patrolled uh, so stringently and violently. You know, because men are aggressive, men are get their way through aggression and displays of aggression. Why, why do you say white men in particular? Because there's not that many black transitioners that I can see. I think it's mainly a white, middle-class uh, fad. Why, you know? why do you think that is? Again, I simply think it just gives, it's, it's a bit of a kind, in a world that is becoming slightly more difficult for white men, it is a bit of a kind of playing life on easy mode. Once you say, I'm a woman, doors open, you know, right. doors that shouldn't be open to you suddenly open, you know, the women's toilets, women's prizes, you know, like, let's say you're a, a mediocre sportsman, okay, in need of money, you're ranked 200th of your, your sex, you know, in a particular sport. If you, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you join a race and win five grand? you know, and beat a few women. Maybe because it would feel dishonest, but if you set that aside... Yeah. Yes, but... Well, the, and the other thing was maybe you get teased for it, but of course that's not allowed either, right? Well, yeah, exactly. They're protected in all in, in, in different ways. It was a, a, a Rogan interviewed Riley Gaines uh, the other day, and she she said that there was one race, and I, I would imagine he was Lee, Lee Thomas... Uh, what's his name? Lee Thomas? I think it's Lee Thomas. Uh, the swimmer. Uh, six foot towering over the other competitors usually comes in one second or even two seconds ahead of ev everyone else, which is a hell of a long time in swimming. Uh, I think he probably went easy in one race and uh, allowed her to get an equal first. They had an equal time, you know? And so there was only one trophy to give out and purely arbitrarily, they gave it to Lee, you know? Mm. They, li they literally had them both together and they said, we're going to give it to Lee because I don't know what excuse they gave, but apparently the guy was kind of embarrassed as he gave it. Um, so, you know, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you? And I think that this, this, what this movement does is, it's like, <clears throat> you notice in, in America, right, where they changed the law so that you couldn't be prosecuted for uh, stealing a certain amount from shops. So we've all seen the videos where people are going into shops and just filling up bags full of stuff and just walking out. No one is challenging them. And that just shows that, you know, if you put the line here, people will stay behind the line. But if you put it over here, millions of people will cross it. Yeah. You know? And, and those people, as you said about shame, are people who have no shame, you know? Yeah. Or people who are desperate. Or people who, 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 who just have a kind of a, you know, a lack of, um, you know... I don't, I don't want to say morals, it seems too easy, but, but you know, just people who, they need those lines because otherwise they can't decide them for themselves. Well, I guess there are two ways that societies maintain order. One is laws yes. and the other is social mores. Yes, and, and, and that's, where, that's what... Where social mores have collapsed, yeah. if laws are also abolished or, or, or liberalised or whatever you like to say, then... Yeah, it's a free for all. Well, you know that's that. Th th there's some very dishonest arguments that trans activists use. One of them is that, uh, you know, with female and male toilets, uh, men men can enter them anyway. So why are you keeping trans women out? But that's not the point. And a very good phrase from feminists is, uh, "Good men stay out, so bad men stand out." You know, and so now what we have is, is a situation where in Portland, a woman challenged a man. Um, uh, in the toilets and received two year prison sentence um, suspended, uh, but fifty hours, something like five hundred hours uh, uh, community service, and that's just happened. So you know that's the world we're we're heading towards if we're not careful. So yeah. that reminds me of the case in Canada a few years ago, British Columbia, I think, where the trans man wanted to get a wax treatment in a spa, I think, and there was a similar thing where the the That's women who refused to do it got in trouble initially, at least. I can't remember, was that reversed in the end? That was Jessica Yaniv, who is an That's right. absolute oh. lunatic. And it was yeah. a tra and he's, tr he's a trans woman, not a trans man. Oh, you're right, sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, he wanted uh, all these uh, immigrant uh, uh, beauty parlors, to, or sorry, these beauty parlors that were run by immigrants to wax his testicles, you know? And they said, no, sorry, we only do women. 
and he sued them. And he said, but they're female testicles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As I, If I recall correctly, he was the one who liked to go into bathrooms and, and interrogate young women about period products. And that's like. right, that's right. I, I don't think it was in bathrooms. I think it was in online forums. Right. But he did like to go into bathrooms. Take, like one of the things you find with all these men is they love taking trophy pictures of themselves uh, in women's bathrooms. And someone else pointed out that often they will put one leg up on a thing. And he says it's the same, it's the same pose you see from hunters uh, when they put a, put a leg up on the animal they've just killed. <laughs> you know, so, so I think that like, like one, those photographs, there's an Irish, an Irish one who does it, uh, an Irish journalist who, who, who did it. And she, he, excuse me, he goes into women's toilets and he takes a photograph of himself giving, giving the camera a finger, you know? And it's like, that, that's not civil rights. <laughs> you know, that's something else, you know? Well, yeah. One thing I sometimes think uh, when I'm thinking about this issue is that uh, ultimately a solution will have to involve some kind of sense of different context. So, and maybe even some kind of documentation around which context you're sort of allowed to enter. I mean, because it may be, for example, that it makes more sense for people who are post-operative to be able to go into certain spaces, right? Sure. So you could have a sort of system where it's kind of like, I'm a trans person and for certain purposes you'll call me these pronouns and I'm allowed to go into these areas and these other areas. But then in other situations, so for example, medical situations where it's actually rel clinically relevant whether you're biologically male or female, you'll still have your original sex mm. on the ID card or whatever, or in the records. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that that's the pragmatic way we should actually be discussing these issues. Of course, it's very difficult to because the, yeah, because the temperature is so high. And that's the yeah. problem. We can't actually sort out pragmatic and respectful ways ahead. If people are not allowed to contest their different positions in good faith. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's all are, are threatened with arrest and prison. If they say something wrong, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, or, that to or, me just, uh, or their careers are ended. You no know? matter what the issue is, that just chills me. Because yeah. yeah. What kind of free society, well, it's not a free society anymore once that starts to happen. So. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the people who will suffer, you know, the, 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 the what you might call trans trenders who, who are just growing their hair long and, and, and getting likes on social media, you know, when all this is over, they'll just wipe off the makeup, cut their hair and walk away untouched. Mm -hmm. the transsexuals will suffer the gay people will suffer who have who who have been you know tricked into supporting this movement you know they are the ones who will pay the price and you know for years we've been saying there's going to be a backlash there's going to be a backlash you know and i can see already that the attitudes of many women is is hardening uh against everyone the, the differentiation between transsexuals and transgender is, is breaking down and women are getting angrier and angrier and i totally understand why that is you know yeah um so yeah it's it, we're heading toward unless something is unless and here's the thing here's another thing it doesn't take much if i if i when i when i was getting cancelled if i'd had two or three big names standing by me i would have been okay yeah and because i was completely isolated uh I haven't written any comedy in six years, mm. you know? So it, it just doesn't take much. Well, that's interesting to hear because I, I suppose one possible question to you in New Zealand would be, what do you mean you've been cancelled? Because this is often the argument, right? What do you mean sure. you've been cancelled? You've just been, you know, you're on a trip in New Zealand, people are talking to you, going on all these he, podcasts, radio. You are radio. on free Kiwis. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. This is it's obviously the peak of your career, right? So <laughs> you're not cancelled, are you? Yeah. So, well, you know, I mean... So when you I, say you haven't written any comedy, does that mean that you've, you, you've tried to write comedy and you had a writer's block or you've written it and people just wouldn't accept well, it? Well, I wrote a musical. I wrote... The Father uh, Ted, right? Yeah, the Father Ted musical. And that's not coming out. That's not coming out. And that's like, that was th three or four years writing it. Um, it was, it had all the songs queued up, ready to go. The songs were great. Um, the story was, you know, it, it had a little bit of a way to go, but not much. We, we actually staged it twice for backers with um, dance routines and everything, you know. So it was ready to go. That was my pension because I was beginning to realize that writing comedy, for certainly for British television, had begun to kind of stopped paying i did a show called count author strong and because dvds are gone because um the bbc never repeated it 
I just didn't get any any money. There was a funny thing that happened to me once. Netflix bought it, my last show. And uh, I was like, oh my God, that's such great news. And I said to... Um, I said to uh, my agent, how much, do I, how much will I get for this? And she said, oh, no, uh, you owe them money. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, because the BBC didn't repeat it, they already paid their repeat fee, so that has to be paid back before you get any money. Mm. You know? So I just realised this, this kind, for national TV in the UK, unless you're guaranteed success, it's not really a goer. You know, so the yeah. TED musical was me going, OK, if I write this, get this out and it's a success, then I could just do comedy more as a kind of a project that if it doesn't work out, it'll still be OK because I'll have this money from the from the uh, musical. Yeah. And so, yeah, all my plans were scuppered and and and, uh, y- you know, I'm I'm actually working on something at the moment uh, for the first time in, in six years, as I say. And we think what we probably do is is I'll use a pen name until the very last moment, yeah. and and then reveal that I wrote it. I know? mean, it's kind of a perfect storm for comedy in in many ways. I mean, I think all, all the the recorded arts, whether it's music or comedy or even filmmaking, mm. uh, are under threat from yeah. streaming because the income streams for the artists are poorer as a result. Yeah. And then we have this cultural and environment where comedy is if not dead then on life support because you can't make funny jokes anymore because funny jokes involve offending people or yep. potentially offending people. Yep. Uh, so where does that leave comedy as a as an art form? And, well, and as we reflected before as an important social mechanism to release pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well that's that's the thing when you can't do a job properly it's over. You know, like like I know you you guys here. Uh, 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 there's a few media companies who are who are having to cut back drastically. Oh well, yeah, I mean, the, one of the big networks, News Hub, has just announced that it's closing down, and and TV One, which is the state broadcaster, is laying off people and yeah, ending a whole lot of what people might think of as essential things, yeah. news services and the like. Yeah, whether they're really essential anymore is a a debatable question and but but still it's well i like the bbc is the same the bbc i think newsnight which was the one of the big fa- flagship shows for the bbc that's laid off i think half of its staff in some department or something but it's really been it's really been cut down and i always say like if they started telling the truth yeah their ratings would go through it the might, roof. It might make a difference yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah but they like, tell the truth about a lot of stuff don't they i mean cuz I, I i often I'm in this mindset too of like the mainstream media is not being honest about certain things. And I think that's true. But when I go back to England, I watch the BBC, I think they're mostly fine. It's just with these issues like, like trans issues. Oh, they've gotten, they've gotten better on that recently too. But yeah, well, I mean, I, maybe I'm, I, I shouldn't have said the BBC. I think maybe I was thinking more of uh, the guardian, for example, has, has published more trans skeptical columns recently than it, than you could have imagined it doing very in 2020 recently, yeah. very recently yeah. mm-hmm. and and only i think because they're beginning to get embarrassed into doing it you know but like uh there's the bbc is so captured that uh I don't think they've yet reported on the WPATH files. And the WPATH files... Yeah, re- I hadn't heard of that. Maybe we'll try and look it up after the yeah, podcast. And yeah, it. and the WPATH files is basically, I think, what has given, uh, you know, recently the UK government the cover to uh, pull back on these uh, blockers for kids. Because the WPATH files re- reveal it's all experimental. Some of the people involved in these decisions aren't scientists or doctors. They're, they're activists. Um, it's it's a shocking document, you know, and uh, uh, but the but the thing is, the BBC is still not reporting honestly on it, and is still lying by omission. And if they can lie by omission about the health of children, then how can you trust them on anything else? I used to I, I used to have um, I used to the only time I used to get angry at uh, at the media was when they accused us of using canned laughter in sitcoms all my sitcoms were filmed in front of audiences right you know and it used to drive me mad and i remember thinking at the time if a tv critic whose job it is is to cover this uh this form is is so mistaken and so wrong and and lying to this extent 
then what else could they be lying to us about? But that that idea just fluttered across my head because I'm just a, they were just silly comedy shows, so I didn't didn't follow that idea yeah. to its extent. But when it comes to the health of children, there's a woman called Polly Carmichael. She was interviewed. She was the head of GIDS, uh, uh, the Gender Identity Service uh, in the UK, and she went on a children's TV program and told children that puberty blockers were fully reversible. And at the same time... I'll tell you what, our Ministry of Health said that on its website yeah. at one point. It's now been removed. But. Yes, yes. And so um, so basically, but then Polly Carmichael in another interview around the same time admitted that it was an experiment. They said, we didn't know one way or the other, so we thought we'd just give it to them and see how, see what happened, you know? So, so we're talking about lifetime uh, changes to... Uh, children's health and fertility you know if you for instance if you go on testosterone if you cross on to testosterone from cross sex or from from puberty blockers um you uh women increase their risk of heart attacks to four times that of men mm. you know um women will go into the menopause 20 30 years too early you know and if you're you have the if you're if you're a 24 year old and you take a tumble you just stand up and walk away. You never think about it again. If you have osteoporosis from, you know, hitting menopause too early or your bones are brittle from hitting me- me- menopause too early, you take a tumble, your life has changed forever, Yeah. you know? And one thing I noticed when I go to, um, uh, when I because I used to go to a lot of uh, Kelly J's um, uh let women speak events, and you would occasionally see this is trans- Kelly J. Keen Mitchell, a- a- yes. aka Posey Parker. Posey just Parker. to be clear, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing I kept noticing was young men, trans identified, with walking sticks and walkers, even in some cases, you know, like the the old lady walking frames, yeah, walking frames, yeah. And I I used to think, oh my god, are they are they doing some sort of disability scam or something like that. And someone said, no, they, they've fallen over. Their bones are brittle, brittle because of, uh, because of cross-sex hormones. And that's their life now. But this is one of the fascinating things about the current moment, though, is that I think it is a lot like religion, right? You, you can believe things which, from a more objective point of view, might seem absurd. But then with BBC journalists nowadays, it strikes me that some of them are obviously in that religious cult but the religious cult only applies to certain things this is why it's like religion like you may believe that jesus actually got up after he died but that no one else ever will right Mm -hmm. and you may be rational in in every other way and you can be a scientist or or whatever so i think that's probably what's going on but i I agree it's captured in the sense that i think that that the pressure comes from from people's social context so because nowadays basically all journalists and all academics are drawn from the same sort of upper middle class yes ranks in the way that journalists especially didn't used to be um they have to sort of say those things. They have to not report on certain things because the next dinner party they go to in North London, they're going to get hell for it, right? Uh, I could have just said exactly what you just said. That that's my, I I call the journalists who are ignoring this, you know, I call it the dinner party circuit. You know, they 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 it, it is a completely middle class, um, uh, uh, mostly white phenomenon. And they all have friends who have decided that their child is trans, who f- swallowed this whole philosophy hook, line, and sinker. And they see, you know, what happened to me and what happened to other people like me, and they just don't want to have anything to do with it. And so what you find a lot of the time, there's a guy, Alistair Campbell, over in the UK, he used to be Blair's right-hand man or, or publicity guy, and uh, he, his thing is to dismiss it as culture war. He just says that's oh, culture war stuff, you know. And this is what they tell themselves, you know. They, 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 uh, they. A lot of them have kids who are feeding them this line of of nonsense, and they just think it's a thing to do with kids and a yeah. thing to do with. Well, I also think that conservatives, in particular, people who are self-identify as to the right of center in the political spectrum, they took a massive L, as the Americans would say. They took a huge loss with uh, arguments about homosexuality and gay marriage in the 90s and early 2000s. Yeah. And I think they kind of deserve to lose that one. I think that was they were on the wrong side. But I also think you shouldn't sort of retrospectively cancel people who are sort of honorably kind of making an argument. Yeah. But I think that what's happened since then is that people, especially on the right, have seen the trans issue coming and have been like, oh my God, we don't want to do this again. We're not, yes. We don't want to be on the wrong side. And, they, and they've, thought of, it, they've <laughs> thought of it in exactly the same terms, that trans people are exactly like gay people. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. already something a little bit different, right? Because... 
someone who's homosexual, someone who's like a gay man, you can't really, well, you, you could be repressed, but basically once you sort of figure it out, you can't really be wrong about who you're attracted to. It's not a claim in the same sense as saying, I am actually a woman in fact, right? Especially if you really double down like nowadays, where it's like well, metaphysically in every way. it's a claim a man, about right? sexual preference, right? And, yeah, it's and, a claim and, versus where, something more whereas, metaphysical. Whereas the trans claim is ontological. It's That's about right. what That's you are rather than a yeah. preference. Yeah, and it also depends mostly on other people doing what you want them to right. do, rather than your own. Rather than just leaving you alone. To yes. Do, yeah. <laughs> gay, gay marriage literally doesn't affect anyone except the mm. people getting married, you know. Um, uh, but, but trans ideology affects everyone, because suddenly we all have to use female pronouns for people who are obviously male or vice versa, you know. And, it's, and, and it's, of course, this is how Jordan Peterson first came to, to fame, but that's right. with the laws in Canada that said that you could be prosecuted if you misgendered somebody, used the wrong pronoun and, and his point which I thoroughly agree with is that you know it's even worse than controlling what uh, you're allowed to say through hate speech laws that's saying if you say this thing you'll be prosecuted mm. it's compelled speech it's saying you must say this thing or you'll be prosecuted and and I agree with them that it's even worse because yeah. it, it starts to bend the mind out of shape once you conform with that it's, yeah it's it's actually a well-known method of to uh, impl implementing totalitarianism is to force people to say things that they know are wrong or disagree with. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a reason why Orwell used 2 plus 2 equals right. 5, you know, to, right. to, to make his point. You know, it's, it's the simplest expression of that um, possibility, you know. And th there's even in, in Orwell a... Um, there's a conversation you may you may remember with someone whose job it is is to remove words from the dictionary yes, and throw them down the memory hole. Throw them out so people will not know how to talk about certain issues, and that is happening here. Except uh, sometimes it involves the additional words, like for instance, uh, cis woman, you know, which is an unnecessary word uh, and a meaningless word, um, but that's been introduced to to make it seem like there's two types of women, mm -hmm. cis women and trans women, you know? And it's a similar thing. It's, 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 a, it's a, a, a very kind of, um, in some ways, very clever. It's amazing it took off. It, it's amazing. It's an amazing bit of, you know, it, it's propaganda that never had a Goebbels or, a, you know, right. a, a, a figurehead behind it. And I, that's the, the other interesting thing about this movement. There's no leaders. Mm. It's very like mass movements of the past, you know, it, it, like National Socialism, Communism, even Christianity. They first attacked the family, you know. The, 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 Jesus apparently said, or in the New Testament, he says, uh, I will turn husband against wife you know I, I, father I came not to bring peace but a sword exactly exactly and um all these organizations in what eric hoffer called uh the their active uh, revolutionary phase they all say you gotta cut ties with your family if they don't agree with all this stuff you know um and it's it's the same thing but the only difference is there's not one leader and i think that's because uh the internet has just changed the uh uh the texture of our lives so completely that now we could really the mob can take control you know and yeah. they kind of have you know they've installed themselves in so many organizations corporations institutions the police in the uk is captured you know kelly jakeen heard she said she heard a story from one policeman who said they they watched a presentation by stonewall our our big trans pro trans um, organization over there and uh, her her photograph came up, and all the policemen in the room booed, you know. So that's yeah. that's how completely they've been brainwashed. Uh, I've seen similar things that the, when I used to work at the university here, when gender critical feminism was mentioned, everyone went, "Ooh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right." Yeah, you know, yeah. it seems like a. I mean, I think it, they're probably right about a lot of it, but b. It's like it's meant to be a university, and we 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 all often explicitly tell students that they're meant to respect other people's ideas, right? Yeah. So then yeah. you know we don't do it except these ones, <laughs> except those ones, yeah. except the bad ones. Yeah, that's, right. that's that's the one. <laughs> but, yeah. but Graham, you mentioned before you used the phrase, when all of this is over. Mm. And perhaps there are some hopeful signs, especially in the UK with the closure of Tavistock and James mentioned the appearance of the odd article in The Guardian that questions some of this stuff. Mm. Do you think that the tide is turning? Do you think we'll, in the next few years we'll start to, ha start to have a more rational conversation about this, which I, I hope will be to the benefit of those 
people who are suffering from genuine sure. gender dysphoria and, and start to get rid of some of the nonsense that is damaging lives, especially young people's lives. Yeah, I think I think the WPATH files, once they once they properly sink in, it's a huge document, it's 242 pages, you know, um, but once it sinks in uh, what's been happening and why it's been happening, I think what will happen is we will start to think of uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria as what it is, which is basically anorexia with a much better marketing campaign, you know, um, and I, I'm hoping also that it will lead us to having a conversation that, that we never had, that we should have had the moment we all got broadband, which is what is the internet doing to us? What are the dangers associated with it? How can we stop it happening again? Well, the, you know? the last of those questions is a very invidious one <laughs> because, I mean, every technology is a two-edged sword. Sure. And... There's, but, no, there's no way that people are going to stop using it. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but 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 all I'm saying is that we need to have the conversation. Right. Like, yeah. for instance, the, you know, now kids will see, you know, really violent pornography before they've even held hands. Yeah. You know, what effect is that having? We haven't even yeah. mentioned no, it. No, we haven't. You know? So so there needs to be a conversation. There needs to be a, I, I'm not saying we need to crack down on the internet. There was something I was, <laughs> was an Irish politician who was famous for saying in the early days of the internet, and I used to find this terribly funny. Uh, he was famous for saying, the internet must be stopped. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I thought that was, uh, for, for years, I thought. But now I kind of see his point. <laughs> it's, it's, it's King Canute stuff, though, well, isn't it? it yeah, we can't stop. We can be more aware of the dynamics of, of crazes and how they yes. limit rational discussion. Yes. Um, I think we, we should have been aware of that already from the rest of human history and the, and the idea that this would probably be exa exacerbated. These things would probably be sort of blown up by the internet. Well, I, I'm reading a book called um, The... the uh, uh, Delu the delusions of crowds, I think it's called. I can't Madness, Madness of crowds. No, that's no, the no, Douglas Murray it's one. Not Douglas Murray, no. No, yeah. it's it's called. Oh, it's called something like the delusions of crowds. But anyway, it's an econo economist who wrote it, and he pointed out that just after the invention of the printing press, there was oh, yeah. like cults forming all over the place, and they were like pogroms and mass suicides and all this sort of you stuff. You could argue that the the big fight between the Protestants and the Catholics that yes. that consumed Europe for. Two, three hundred years was responsible exactly due to that. Yeah. yeah, and then you know, but also we we've we've had from the printing press, you know, the greatest uh, advance in 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 human, um, you know, the human beings' ability to think that uh, w w would have been impossible before then. Yeah, and I do think that the internet, you know, <laughs> it's it. I was such an evangelist for it in the early days, and I mm. I still think that if you know. For instance, I thought that scientists would be uh, able to be like exponentially more effective by working together. And then I found out later on that scientists are very guarded of all their, and they don't share and they don't kind of do that, you know. But I do think that we have had at least 10 years of the internet at its worst. Mm. Um, and, you know, we just need to turn it around, but we also it's easy to forget about all the good things it does do i mean science is maybe guarded but also there's a lot more scientific information and papers available and it's easier to get access to them sure so but but i but i do think that like someone said an interesting thing they said we are losing our ability our ability to create the internet because the uh, ability of the internet to be a permanent distraction means that you don't do that kind of deep work yeah. and deep reading that leads to innovations like that. That may well be true. Yeah. Okay, we're just going past an hour, so I'm going to give you one more question. So this is your chance to redeem yourself <laughs> in the eyes of the, the work if you want to. You probably don't. Yeah. But um, So you said a few times in this interview things like you think that transsexualism is basically a mental illness. So do you not think, though, that say I'm like a 40-year-old man, which I am actually, a 41-year-old man, and next year I decide I really want to go around dressed as a woman, I want people to refer to me as Sheila, and, uh, you know, I'm pretty serious about it. Do you not think I, I should be allowed to do that? And, and that, you know, if you were my friend, you wouldn't sort of say that's, you know, you're just being insane. Is, is that not a kind of thing you can do as a sane person? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I mean, but, you know, we already uh, already did it. Bowie did it, you know? And but Bowie would never have said he was a woman. He wouldn't have gone into women's toilets. He wouldn't but say, say I do. I, I want people to refer to me as a woman. Yeah, fine. But but um, 
you know, you can't demand it. You can't say that I have to do it. Um, and and again, like here's the here's the key thing that we sometimes forget: the actual areas where there there is a conflict are very few. You know, toilets, sports, uh, prisons, sh- prisons, shelters, rape rape crisis centers. There's not that many. You know, beyond that, fill your boots. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do whatever you want. But when it comes to these very, very precious things, and I always, and my thing is basically that, you know, I can't follow my daughter around to make sure she's safe. I have to trust society to some extent to keep men out of her spaces. You know what I mean? So the I, that was one of the reasons I got into it. I just thought, well, uh, society isn't keeping her safe. So I have to do my part to help that along. So, yeah. Do whatever you like. You know, I don't care if people... We all wore togas at one point. No one could tell the difference. How, how are the trans-Roman people? <laughs> do, do you know? the, the other point to make about that question is that liberalism cuts both ways. You know, I, I would say, yes, go for it. And, and I think we should be much less insistent on uh, gender roles. If, if young boys want to wear dresses and play with dolls, good on them. And sure. likewise, if girls want to do boy things, who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but where where I draw the line is where the authoritarianism kicks in and says you must yeah. respect my views by parroting them yourself yes. and, and by right. going along with the things that I say are markers of that. And yeah. no, I don't have to do that actually. And, and you can't discuss the issues, yeah. which is actually one of the reasons that we started this podcast uh, to actually discuss things that you're not supposed to discuss. So yeah. Done yeah. that again today. Good. <laughs> so thanks very much, Graham Linhan. Thanks and, indeed. Uh, now that you said that last little bit, of course, there will be no controversy about you at all in New Zealand or anywhere else. So, Excellent. Yeah. Great. It's all fixed. I'm glad I finally sorted it out. Thank you. <laughs>